Joining us today uh, for this roundtable, we have Dr. Kim Mullenix. She's an associate professor and beef extension specialist here in Auburn. Uh, we have Dr. Leanne Gillard. She's an uh, assistant professor and forage extension specialist. Jerry Thompson, he has been an Alabama extension animal science and forage uh, regional extension agent for around 20 years in the Tennessee Valley region of Alabama. Uh, Steve Stroud, he owns and manages uh, poultry and hay uh, operation in Pike County. He's active uh, in the hay and forage committee in, uh, with the Alabama Farmers Federation and serves as a board, uh, board member for the Federation. Uh, also, Wade Hill, he farms at Lawrence County. He owns and operates Head Oak Farms and is also a district conservationist uh, with NRCS. And uh, he breeds high quality quarter horses and uh, produces high quality alfalfa hay, primar primarily marketing uh, to horse owners. So without further ado, uh, let's, let's get started. So today we will be talking about alfalfa. So alfalfa is often uh, referred as the queen of forages uh, due to its high nutritive value. Uh, however, its adoption in the South uh, has been limited uh, due over uh, the last decades. And uh, perhaps uh, it can be useful to those that are not as familiar uh, with alfalfa production to start talking about its requirements and some of the main uh, challenges we might face in, here in the South USA. So uh, I'd like to start with uh, one question for Lian. Uh, Lian, what are the main uh, soil requirements someone should be aware when considering planting alfalfa? Liliani, so alfalfa, as I always say, it's a queen because it has such high quality, but that also means it's a diva because it needs a lot higher requirements than most of the forages that we use in Alabama or in the Southeast. So as all, with all legumes, it is not tolerant of acidic soils, which most of our soils in Alabama are. So um, you need to make sure that your pH of your soil is at least a 6.5. So some of our legumes can get away with a little bit lower, but this one in particular is 6.5. On top of that, because it's a deep rooted plant, you also need to make sure your subsoil pH is adequate in at least a 5.5. So this is something we don't typically do. Um, you can contact your local extension agent for information on that. Um, the good thing is since it's a legume, it doesn't need nitrogen per se. Um, sometimes we might use nitrogen to help it, but typically, you know, in general, it doesn't need nitrogen. It might need some uh, micronutrients like boron. Um, it also will need potassium and phosphorus. So soil testing is very important in order to make sure that you have adequate pH, um, which can take multiple years to fix um, if it's too low, but also make sure that your nutri other nutrients are adequate um, because it is a little expensive to establish. We want to make sure that, that you do a, a good job and have everything ready for it to, to establish well. Okay, uh, thank you. So moving to uh, to talking more about the, uh, we just talked about the great nutritive value uh, that alfalfa has. Uh, so Kim, what are the main uh, benefits of alfalfa inclusion on animal diets and uh, diet and their performance? Thanks for the question. I would say that probably some of the biggest considerations for that from an animal standpoint are improved overall digestibility as well as crude protein value relative to if we were to look at just our warm season perennial grasses alone, which are typically used for hay production in the state. And so uh, by integrating alfalfa either into those warm season perennial grass systems or by using alfalfa monocultures alone, we can see improved quality benefits. Uh, from an animal standpoint, that can look a couple of different ways. Generally, we see that they would have improved consumption of a higher quality product. And subsequently, we would hope that that would later be seen in improved animal performance or gain or improved body condition of those animals. 
Okay, thank you. So, um, Leanne started talking about uh, the, soil, the requirements for the soil fertility. And uh, one thing that sometimes can be challenging is the establishment, uh, just the variations year by year with rainfall and uh, other, um, other weather related uh, things. So, Jerry, what would be the best practices that uh, can help optimize our chances on getting a good establishment? Okay, thanks for that question. Yeah, so um, the biggest challenge, I think, for most typical livestock producers and hay producers in, in Alabama is we are not used to working at such high pHs. So we, we've got, uh, to, and, and it's, it's a slow process to raise the pH by applying time and whatnot. So you've got to be pretty far ahead of time to, to get that pH up to where it needs to be. Uh, and so, and I think uh, site selection is very challenging. I, I was thinking about this on, on the way down this morning that my forages professor back in the early 80s at Auburn, he had the statement that his first choice of where to grow alfalfa would be on deep, well-drained soils, and his second choice of where to grow it would be on deep, well-drained soils. So I think um, choosing the right place to plant something is just a, a good challenge also. And then I think... Um, you know, most hay producers, we're not used to dealing with a crop that's a legume. So dealing with weed control issues, it's, it's not impossible. And there's there's good resources online here uh, from Dr. Russell about how to do that. But to get the weeds under control ahead of time, that, that's going to be plaguing you during the time of establishment. Um, I, I think that's a, a, a big challenge and a, and a really important thing to be dealing with. And then I think just the challenge of we're dealing with a, a new crop. So um, just the continuing to learn. Um, if somebody's looking to do this, it's different than Bermuda grass or fescue hay or something like that. So just um, the need to continually learn and, and, and stay up to date on what needs to be done to grow a crop like alfalfa. Okay. So um, Wade, how long have you been planting alfalfa? Well, Jerry and I was just talking about that, and I think it's been 17 years. Okay, 17 years. What about you, Steve? Uh, you, you've been growing alfalfa for a while, right? Yes, um, I'm on my second year of alfalfa, okay. and, um, and it's doing quite well. Okay, so yeah, I, I wanted to hear more about your experience uh, for both of you, what have been the experience, and it's good that we are going to have a con uh, different point of views. You, you've been doing that for a couple of years, and uh, Wade has been all, almost for uh, two decades so far, so what, what do you, uh, what are the main points that you had as a challenge or um, points that you had as your experience planting alfalfa so far? Okay, I'll go first. Um, actually, uh, I had a very successful first year of, of planting. Um, we got a great stand up first year. Um, I did go ahead about a year and a half ahead of time and I applied three tons of, of high cal lime per acre to get my soil pH up. It was actually around a seven when we planted. But um, what we did was went in and, and sprayed a, a burn down uh, glyphosate on the Bermuda in early October. And um, that's when we went in with a no-till drill and planted and, and got a great stand doing that. What about you, Jerry? Well, some of the things that we've ran into here over the past 17 mm -hmm. years, you know, to start with, we did not have the access to the Roundup Ready. So mm -hmm. one of our big things was the weed control because you had to start early. Um, now, I do agree with everything that's been said about the pH and the fertilizer. You definitely got to start way ahead of time on that. Picking out that good site, I've even tried a few sites that I thought were iffy and the majority of the time if you think they're iffy walk away put something mm -hmm. else there because it has not worked 
Now, since the Roundup Ready seed has been available, the biggest thing that we've run into in getting establishment is Mother Nature. You know, have I got the right kind of weather to get the ground prepared? Um, I have done some of it no-till, but the majority of our alfalfa is conventional till. All right. Well, you've got to have good weather to get the ground ready, then to get the alfalfa up and get a enough growth on it to withstand that first winter. Um, and if somebody's going to do this, I guess my biggest thing is to tell them to be prepared for failure. Because in 17 mm -hmm. years, I've had three years that's been failure planting. And we've right. tried to plant a little bit each year. Mm -hmm. Because I get four to five years out of it, depending on the site. Mm -hmm. You're constantly having to re and we try to space that out to where I've got alfalfa. Uh, in 17 years, that's worked until this year. And between me making a mistake and Mother Nature hitting me this year, I don't have any alfalfa. First time in 17 years because of failures. Mm -hmm. But it will happen. Even if you try to do everything perfect occasionally, Mother Nature's just not going to play with you. Yeah, so last year uh, we had a prolonged prolonged drought here in Alabama, right? That's That was one of the reasons for um, the failure that, that you're talking about? or Well, I don't know if it was the drought as much as once it got to where I could plant, mm -hmm. I was pushing it at the end of the planting season. Okay. So I got it planted barely in time, I felt like, but then when it started raining, I mean, it just never let up. So I had excess water and I had a problem with volunteer ryegrass coming mm -hmm. up in the field. Since I had plowed that up, stirred the soil, I brought up some seed that was ready to germinate. Mm -hmm. Well, it was so wet, I was torn in between, do I take a chance of spraying and making roots or do I wait for it to dry? Well, the next thing I know, here we are in springtime and by the time it got dry enough to hold my rig up to spray well it was too late so between the excess water and the competition from the volunteer ryegrass i think i've lost a whole lot of what i've planted now we've got it cut right now fixing to start bailing any minute now mm -hmm. still hoping to have some to come back through that jerry and i spotted a little bit whether it's going to be enough to be a viable stand is still yet to be determined mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, so you, I think you mentioned during uh, your talk that you had some stands that uh, were were good for four to five years, right? Yes. Okay, that's that's really good. And uh, so, just going back to uh, to you, Leanne, um, what what would be the potential yield uh, to be expected or even a uh, number of harvests per season when you're cutting for hay? So I'm gonna give you the typical extension answer and that is it depends. So mm -hmm. a lot of that's gonna obviously, first of all, depend on your fertility. So whether you're grazing or hay, we suggest for alfalfa doing soil test every year to make sure you're on top of your soil fertility. And that's the number one thing that's going to end up limiting your yield production. Um, another thing that's going to make it depend is whether or not you are doing a monoculture, or as uh, Dr. Mullenix mentioned, you can interseed it in Bermuda grass. So when you interseed it, you're going to see differences in yield. Now, your overall hay yield will be much greater because you're taking the benefit of having both alfalfa and Bermuda grass, but you're going to slightly compromise the alfalfa and the Bermuda grass yield a little bit. In a monoculture, um, and I, I'm going to throw a number out there, and I'm probably going to see, I'm staring right at Dr. Bouton, so <laughs> screen. So from what I, I've seen in general, we can get about five to eight tons of dry matter in the southeast. Um, mm -hmm. On average, I'm going to say, again, that's going to depend on a lot of factors. I'm sure there are scenarios where people have seen more and plenty of scenarios where people have seen less. But on average, we can see that. Um, in terms of cuttings, you can get a couple of cuttings in the spring as well as several in the fall. Again, depending 
and whether you're interceding it or doing a monoculture, um, but we're going to say it's going to be, you know, four to five cuttings a year. Um, in the alfalfa Bermuda grass system, you can do eight of the total system. Well, that wouldn't be all alfalfa. That would be Bermuda grass as well. But in that system, they've seen in, in Georgia that they can get eight or nine cuttings a year. So there's lots of factors that are going to determine uh, the yield of alfalfa. Okay, just before I move to uh, to receives and weights experience on that, I just want to go to your Kim. Uh, harvest timing is very important. So, what what uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what is the criteria to decide when harvesting alfalfa? Right. So I would say that the harvest criteria is dependent on. Uh, first of all, the, the age of the stand. So if it's a newly established stand and we're looking for a criteria for that first harvest, generally we would like for that alfalfa to be at least 10% bloom, perhaps past that, uh, up to even 25% bloom before we would get that first harvest. So while we would potentially have some compromise in terms of the alfalfa quality at those later stages of maturity, what we're doing is we're setting that plan up for success because we're allowing the root system of the alfalfa to be very well established and have a good reserve to then carry us through the subsequent harvest of the season. Now in subsequent years, once the alfalfa is more readily established, we would shoot for that about 10% bloom threshold to be able to harvest going forward. Okay. Uh, so just uh, going to Stephen Wade and uh, feel free to, to start uh, whichever of you uh, wants to start. So what has it been uh, your experience regarding uh, number of cuts, cuttings per year, um, production? Well, I, I've actually had the um, alfalfa Bermuda mix. So um, last year, my first year, I was able to harvest seven cuttings. Um, the first three cuttings were predominantly all alfalfa. Mm -hmm. And then from there on, it was a good mix. So, um, and excellent uh, yields. Um, I was pleased with it and quality as well, too. So, um, we, on our test, we usually average around 23% crude protein on our forage analysis. Mm -hmm. And your first cutting was in April, right, Steve? Yes, uh, I cut it on April the 1st, and then I cut it this past Saturday on May the 9th for the second cutting. I've okay. already got it in the barn as well. Okay. What about your weight? Well, I'm a little further north than Steve is, so I don't get cut near as early as he does because of the weather. But usually the end of April, 1st of May is our first cutting. Um, you know, and the number of cuttings we get a year is all dependent on what kind of summer we have as far as rainfall. I've had a few years to where three cuttings was all we got, period. Mm -hmm. And then I have years where I've cut it six times up here. Now, mine is a monoculture. Somewhere around that fourth or fifth year, once it starts kind of playing out, I will drill some orchard grass in it and have a mix that way for maybe a year or so. Mm -hmm. As tons per acre, you know, th that year that I cut it three times, it was pretty low. I have had as much as nine tons per acre at the end of the year, but now that was a year when everything worked perfect. You know, mm -hmm. as the old saying goes, you could close your eyes and throw the basketball from half court and it went in. That was one of them years. It doesn't happen that often. Okay. Um, so just uh, just going back to the end on the same topic about hay, uh, how, what, what are the main uh, recommendations that we can use to improve hay quality when harvesting alfalfa? So the first thing is going back to what Tim said about the maturity. Any forage maturity is the number one thing. So making sure that you can get in the field um, at the right maturity, but not pushing the plants too, too far and finding that optimization between yield and, and quality. Um, beyond that, alfalfa is very sensitive to overworking. So if you, when you cut it, um, 
if it gets too dry and you you tet it or or rake it, you're going to get a lot of leaf loss. And all the good quality um, nutri nutrients are in the leaves. So you want to make sure that if you are working it, you work it as little as possible. Um, if you do need to tet it, if you need to increase your um, drying rate, um, you can also, we suggest using a mower conditioner um, so that you increase the drying rate um, and don't have to work it quite as much. Um, those come now as a combination. So you want to do uh, a, uh, a crusher. So it uses rubber pads. You don't want to use uh, the V-shaped that kind of strips the leaves that we normally would see with a grass uh, conditioner. So once you have uh, mowed and conditioned it and let it dry, if you do need to tet it, do it preferably in the morning when it's still a little damp. Um, you don't want to do it, like I said, when it's too dry. Also, when you bale it for hay, you know, make sure that when you're raking it up, it has enough moisture, let it finish drying in the windrow. Um, more information on those specific numbers can be found in the um, presentation that I did. You can watch that and I have those specific moisture contents. I can't remember them exactly off the top of my head um, that you don't want to, but once you rake it into a windrow, let it finish curing at that point and then bale it to minimize leaf loss. And that's really what our, our um, goal is. Also store it inside. This is a very high quality, um, very costly hay product. Storing it outside is just gonna diminish the, the quality tremendously. So this is definitely the type of product you wanna be storing inside instead of having outside storage. Okay, so I wanna hear, um, and just one can, uh, this question can be for Jerry Wade and Sue. Um, why, what have been your experience rega regarding diseases and pests on alfalfa stands? Okay, so I, I asked Wade about that a little bit, just mm -hmm. before, and I'll, I'll let him answer, but um, he, he indicates that uh, there, there's been a time or two, and because of some extenuating circumstances a few years ago, I uh, had a little problem with blister beetles, and it's just a time when the, the rain just wouldn't let him get uh, until it was way, way more blooms than we would ordinarily think this, it was impossible to get a cut. But Wade, would you address that? How much, how much insect pressure and disease pressure do you normally deal with? Very, very little. Uh, I mean, enough, or it's not even enough to count. That one time in 17 years, I've had the problem with the blister beetles. Other than that, sometimes I have a few of the alfalfa weevils, one time I had the um, army worms actually got in and I had to spray it. But that's in 17 years, that's the only time I've had any trouble with any kind of insect or and I've, I've never noticed any kind of disease trouble here. Now, I do rotate mine. You know, once I go through that four to five years with it and then I convert it over to the orchard, I may let it be straight orchard for a year or two and have alfalfa somewhere else, and then I come back, and I think that has helped a lot. Okay. Well, Sam? on my farm in South Alabama, um, it was odd last year that my first year of alfalfa, I was uh, uh, after the yeah before the first cutting, the alfalfa weevil just hit me hard, and I was wondering where they came from because there's never been any alfalfa in my area, and uh, we had to spray for those last year, but uh, this year I haven't seen any any sign. Um, as far as blister beetle, we haven't seen any sign of that as well. So um, I've, I've been able to, uh, other than the alfalfa weevil, that's the only, only pressure I've had from insects. Sure. Okay. Um, and for, for you, Stephen uh, Wade, what? What have been the main, uh, I don't know, actually, Wade, have you, uh, have you done hay for only grasses before, either Bermuda or, or, or grass before, planting alfalfa? Yes, before yes. I started, okay. the, it was all grass. Hay. Okay, you so I, I, wanna, I wanna hear, uh, I know Steve uh, has planted, uh, uh, has planted Bermuda grass before as well. Uh, so I want to hear what have been the main management strategies 
and even like the level of management that you notice it's different when dealing with alfalfa versus a grass system? Well, the biggest thing that I've noticed is, you know, when alfalfa needs something, whether it needs spraying for weeds, whether it needs the fertilization, whether it needs cutting for hay, when it needs it, if you think about it twice, you're late. Where okay. grass, you can debate on it a day or two on what to do and it not hurt your quality as much. But with alfalfa, when it needs something, you need to be able to drop everything else and go tend to your alfalfa. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Um, the biggest difference I see as far as dry hay, grass hay, and alfalfa, um, you know, in the past when we cut just Bermuda grass, we'd go out there and cut it. The next day we'd go out there and tatter it. And the next day we would rake it and bale it. Well, with alfalfa is completely different. We're mowing with a mower conditioner. I, I do not tatter mine. Um, I usually wait. Sometimes I'll rake the next day after cutting. Sometimes I'll wait the, till the second day, but uh, I'll go in and rake it early in the mornings. And um, I've actually, I've always used a wheel rake in the past, a, a, what I call a V rake. And um, now I've got a, a rotary rake because it, it does a much better job of wind rowing dry. But uh, yeah, we go ahead and rake it and we might bail it that day and we may have to wait till the next day. It all depends on moisture. And um, plus I've had to add a applicator to apply an inoculant as I bail because I'm bailing you know, anywhere from 18 to 22 percent moisture a lot of times, and you have to have that inoculant to, to keep it from uh, heating up on you. Sure. And see, actually, when you talk about raking it, you know, with grass hay, you rake it any time of the day. What we have done in the past with our alfalfa is, you know, if you cut it this morning, tomorrow night, as everything starts going back get to case getting a little sticky we rake ours at night then the next day we out there and as soon as it gets dry enough that morning mid-morning for lunch we've got a baler running so you know with grass hay we never have rake no hay at night okay so so we uh we mentioned a little bit about this already um in we can have alfalfa mixed with other uh, other stands, so uh, with other uh, grasses stands. So currently, we uh, here in Auburn and in Georgia, we are uh, conducting research on alfalfa Bermuda grass mixtures. And uh, Kim, would you like to tell us a little bit more about the uh, the project that you are working on? Sure. So um, a lot of the, the conversation we're having today is has stemmed from several different things, some ongoing demonstration work in surrounding states. But one thing in particular is related to a research project that we're working on in collaboration with University of Georgia. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Tucker, I believe, is on the call with us and she's the lead on this project, as well as the University of Florida. And we're looking at just evaluating management recommendations for alfalfa Bermuda grass mixtures. So the purpose of that project is to identify appropriate harvest heights as well as harvest frequencies of that mixture that allow us to optimize yield, quality, and persistence of that mixture over time. Uh, so our hope from that initial work then is that we can ultimately apply that information in both hay systems but then move on and evaluate this work under a grazing setting as well. Uh, I also see we have Dr. Boughton on with us. Dr. Boughton is known for his work associated with breeding a lot of the alfalfa varieties that are adapted to the southeastern U.S. And so while we may have more familiarity with those hay management aspects of those systems, really a lot of this ongoing work that we're working on is to, to move us towards developing grazing recommendations for those mixtures as well. Okay, thank you. So uh, 
And this question can be again for Jerry, Wade, and uh, Steve. What are the steps for, uh, so just for producers that are listening us right now and they might start thinking about uh, starting um, planting of alpha monoculture or mixing with uh, other grasses. So what, what are the steps you would recommend them to consider uh, if they plan to start uh, their stands in, they, they plan planting alfalfa in this fall, for example? Well, if they're planning on doing a mix with Bermuda, I would definitely recommend not spraying any uh, gray zone next, uh, any chemical with any type of residual to be extra careful with that. Go ahead and pick out their spot now, soil test and start working on that pH, getting it up. Um, but other than that, just site selection is, is key and, and watch your chemicals. Okay. Yeah, just, just to share with residual herbicides is very problematic with um, alfalfa. So it's important to, uh, to hear what you said about the ones, uh, the herbicides that you should be careful when, uh, when planning to use them. What about you, Wade? Well, if, you know, and I'm speaking from a monoculture standpoint, um, if I want to plant some this fall, I've usually already got my site picked out and got plan in my head. I ain't going to say I've got it written down on paper, but of what I'm going to do last fall. Right. But start right now, I would start with weed management if I hadn't already. Um, you know, and with us doing a, the majority of ours conventional teal this time of the year, I'm starting to break ground right now for this fall planting because I want to, I want to get it tore up and, and make sure I've got everything smooth, weed control handled, by the time fall gets here. And sometimes that's tough to do if you wait till now to start for this fall planting. Okay. Okay, thank you. So do you both, uh, wait and see, do you have more people around you planting alfalfa right now? And uh, which type of systems? Monoculture or mix? I've had a couple of, if you want to call them neighbors within 30, 40 miles that I know of that planted some in the past, been a monoculture. Uh, one of them planted at one time. He cut it for a few years and he quit. The other one, I think, has been a little bit more persistent at trying it, but I haven't talked to him in a year or so, so I don't know if he's still doing it now. But other than them two, I do not know of any in my area. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've only got one neighbor uh, that has actually planted some this past fall. He and I ordered our seed together, and um, he's actually doing a grazing system on it. Um, I haven't had a chance to visit with him to see how it's – I think he, I know he got a good stand, but other than that, I'm not sure about uh, his results on his grazing so far. But. Um, He's the only one I know of. There's a couple of guys that plant some actually for food plots for, for deer hunting. But other than that, I don't okay. know of anybody with, with a grazing or a hay production system in my area. Okay, thank you. So I s just, uh, just going for the, the questions now, uh, and I see we have a couple of them, but if anybody else wants to, to, uh, to ask something, please just type on the chat box uh, below here. Uh, we have one question uh, from Anthony. Have deer been a problem in establishing alfalfa for you? Steve and uh, Jeff, I, I don't know, any, anybody actually on the round table that would like to, to answer? Well, you know, as I stated earlier, in 17 years, we've had three failures. Um, you know, part of that I can attribute to my mistake of not being able to say, no, don't plant this year because, you know, it was dry till it got late and I didn't want to put the seed in the ground without any moisture. Well, by the time I got moisture, put the seed in the ground. I mean, I got a great stand, but it froze out because it did not have time to get the needed growth for winter setting. Um, this past year, 
with all the rain and then the volunteer ryegrass hitting me, you know, I'm considering it a failure right now. So sure. yes, I've had trouble, but then I've had out of them 17 years, I've had 14 years that everything worked great and I got a good stand. Um, mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, I don't look at it as any different than if I was planting corn or soybeans or wheat. Sometimes it's just not going to work the way you want it to. Sure. Uh, but actually, uh, Anthony was asking if you had issues with deer uh, coming to eat the alfalfa growing. Because uh, I know some places, uh, for example, in Florida, we have issues with... Uh, we used to have issues there uh, with jeers coming to legume plots. So uh, did you, I don't know how big of issue jeers deer, are here in Alabama. Uh, did you have any? No, ma'am, and I'm sorry for misunderstanding. Oh, don't worry, don't worry, not a problem. But in my area, we have quite a few deer coming in, but I've never had a problem with them bothering my alfalfa. Uh, mm -hmm. I would that if I was in a highly or populated deer area that I could have. Uh, I know they love it in a deer plot, mm -hmm. but I just don't have enough in my area for that to be a factor. Sure. I've seen deer in mine, but I've never noticed a lot of damage. Now, I will say mine is planted out in the opening. Um, there's not a tree line within, you know, several several hundred yards from my field. So um, other than just seeing a few out browsing, just every now and then, um, never seen much damage. Okay. So we have a second question about pH. So uh, Lee Gilmore uh, says that my pH went from 6.7 last spring to 5.9 this spring. Got a decent first cutting uh, of about one ton per Acre two weeks ago. Should I apply lime after my next cutting or wait to uh, this fall? Who would like to to answer that? Juliani, I, I'll take a stab at it and, and there may be a difference of opinion, but um, in my opinion, being that it takes lime several months to be effective, I would say the sooner you can get it out would be better. Um, obviously, we need rainfall to get it incorporated, um, and rainfall is going to become more unpredictable as we go through the next few months, but at least it would be there when the rain was there, um, because if you wait till the fall, then really the lime won't be effective till in the spring, or in the winter to the spring, so I would say the sooner that you could get that out would be the better. Okay. Anybody else? Would you like to say anything? Well, I would just say he agrees with that. And I, I do too. I've, I've kind of got a saying that I've, I have, it's not necessarily just about alfalfa, but about timing of lime. And mm -hmm. one of my is it, it's going to work till you put it out there. And, you know, and, and it's always going to be slow. So the sooner you can get it out there, the sooner you're going to start seeing results. So in the case of this question, I, I just can't foresee anything, any reason I would say, because this pH fell pretty pretty abruptly, um, I, I want to start trying to fix that as soon as I could. And, and you know, today would be a good day. Okay, thank you. So we just got another question here from uh, Jack from uh, UF. So in Alabama, what are some of the benefits of choosing uh, to grow alfalfa compared to other legume options? Did you have uh, Shivan, um, Wade, or whoever wants to address this question? Did you have experience with other uh, legumes before? You know, I have planted a little clover for hay, but uh, and I've planted the the what I call the hay bean, the soybeans is the hay variety. But you know, mm -hmm. without it's even a better quality, and it lasts for three or four years. If I go out and plant crimson clover and I put it for hay, then I've got to replant again this next year. Um, and I get more tonnage and better quality out of alfalfa. And I think along, you know, Wade's primary, uh, the reason he grows alfalfa is to sell horse hay, hay to horse owners. And so there's that tremendous name recognition and respect for alfalfa hay. And then a lot of horse owners 
right or wrong, object to the idea of clover because of the slobbers that can come along with some varieties of clovers at some times. And so from Wade's perspective, he was advertising grass hay with clover in it. Probably some, a lot of customers would not be terribly interested in that, but with his customers demand for specifically for alfalfa, that that's only met by growing alfalfa. Don't meet it by growing something else. Okay. And it's a, high, it's a high cost to produce crop, but it's also a real high value crop. And, and so uh, Wade, we were talking about some ryegrass that he's harvested, but you know, the cost is the same, grow a lot up there and grow a little up. And so you want to grow something that, that can be very productive and very well received by your customers. I would just say to follow up on that, I agree with Wade and Jerry, especially from the aspect of looking at alfalfa as a monoculture legume option. Uh, when we think about integrating alfalfa into Bermuda grass systems specifically, that's kind of a unique fit for legumes in our state because we historically don't have a lot of legume options that will grow well with warm season perennial grasses. So we have uh, white clover and red clover, you may see some carryover of those into our warm season months early in the summer, but they tend to play out. Whereas the alfalfa and Bermuda grass mixture is a bit more consistent and it's persistent throughout the summer growing season. So I think that's kind of a unique opportunity uh, for that warm season forage legume need or time period that we have in there. Okay. and. Um, I would like to ask if anybody has any questions. I saw somebody raising their hand, but I couldn't see who was it. And, uh, just not in, in proper time to to unmute, unmute the person. So uh, if anybody has any questions, please just uh, type them or raise your hand again. Um, yeah, so one one uh, question that I, I really would like everybody on the uh, on the table to to share your thoughts is do you think alfalfa can be profitable in the southeast USA? I'm going to experience definitely if managed correctly. I agree. Um, there's, there is demand in the southeast for it, for sure. Um, I'm, I, down in my area, I'm in a rural part of the state. I'm not seeing a whole lot of demand from the, the horse owner side, but as far as beef producers, I'm seeing a lot of interest. Um, they're wanting to, to uh, add it in with some feed to get that protein level mixture. And, um, and there is definitely demand there on that side. And so, yeah, I, I deal with the horse clientele quite a bit up here in North Alabama. There are, there's a lot of horses, you know, and, and there's certainly a demand for it and, and an unmet demand. You know, Wade pretty much has his customer base set. I mean, he's, he struggles to meet the, the needs of his established customers. So uh, we have a lot of horse owners that are bringing it in from here, whether that's Tennessee, Kentucky, up in Illinois, or west of here. So there's obviously, based on that, more demand than there is supply, which is a great a great recipe for being profitable in something when, when the demand outstrips the supply. <coughs> to follow up with what Jerry said, and, and I think the beef and, and horse markets are really important, but while the Alabama does not have a huge dairy industry for, for producers that are within a reasonable distance of the state line, be it you know, uh, South Georgia or Mississippi, the dairy industry is also an excellent um, place to, to market this hay. Um, I think it is profitable for the elite few that are intensive in management. I would say for the average farmer though, I would take caution in using it. Um, and and just as I has, it's a good forage agronomist, I have an extension specialist, I have to give the disclaimer of, um, I think, you know, Wade talked about, you know, he has different sections he plants every year and, and thinking about doing it in a stepwise fashion and see if it works for your system. Um, and if you can make it work, then there are definitely opportunities 
um, to market it and be be profitable, be it dairy or or horse. I think one thing that that everybody has brought up is related to management, and that being so key in terms of the economic success of alfalfa. Uh, one of the resources that we've produced out of some of this work is an economic decision tool. Chris Pravat from Florida has a, a budget tool that you can download and it, it's an Excel based file that you can go through and put in your expected input cost associated with the system and it will project based on your operation whether or not this may be a potential fit or not. So that resource is available for download on the southeastcattleadvisor.com website and I'll type that into the chat box here if anybody wants to go look at that later. Thank you, Kim. So we have one more question here. Dr. Solenberger from UF is asking, uh, when preparing to plant alfalfa into Bermuda grass, what rate of glyphosate do you use in the fall to set back the Bermuda grass? Well, on, on our farm, um, I cut it. The first year we planted on October the 17th, I think it was, and I, I waited late that year to cut it, so I only had about a one to two inches of stubble height left, and just as soon as it greened up, I went in and sprayed it with about anywhere from 15 to 20 ounces of Roundup. I think that, that range you'll be fine. You're not going to kill Bermuda with Roundup. I've tried and tried, and I've never been successful with that, so um, you just want to stunt that Bermuda for a period of time and get those seed in the ground and um, you should be fine. Yeah, and uh, he also uh, asked about the Bermuda grass stubble high that you prefer at time of planting alfalfa in the fall. The lower so, the bag, that's for sure, because you want to be able to, to, to get that no-till drill and, and get that seed to ground contact. Now, you don't want to plant those seeds too deep. You want them very shallow, but, but the less competition with the stubble heights you have out there, the better uh, chance of getting a solid stand, for sure. Okay, so why are, uh, I don't know if anybody else has any questions. So why are we wait to see if anybody is going to type or uh, ask something else? Kim, uh, we just released a survey on uh, challenges on alfalfa adoption today. So would you like to, uh, to talk a little bit um, for the last few minutes about that? Sure, kind of as a, a follow up to the round table discussion today, for everybody who's registered for the round table, we'll be sending out a link related to your perception about alfalfa use in the Southeast. And the purpose of that survey is really just to help us identify what are potential limitations for why a producer may or may not consider incorporating alfalfa into their operation. Um, and through that, we're hoping that information can help us form new extension programs around this topic, as well as help inform the research that we're continuing to do on this topic. And so again, that survey link will be coming out later today. So you may see that. And if you're interested and willing to participate, we would certainly encourage you to do so. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? So Lydia, I have a question that came to me by text that Wade don't even know that the text came in, but sure. I text and want to know, wanted me to ask Wade, does he use any kind of preservatives or spray on? As your Steve mentioned, he was doing something because he fails it with a fairly high moisture content. Do you do that? I do not. Um, and I think, I mean, you and I have discussed this, and that was one thing I wanted to say to anybody that's thinking of this in the future. Um, when I started this 17 years ago, this was before most of y'all's time with extension except Jerry, and he can attest to this. Him and Dr. Ball probably got tired of hearing their phone ring from me calling them, but I got awesome information and guidance from extension. Um, and there was a lot of things that was new, and we said, well, here's what we think. Let's try it this direction. As a few of them didn't work like we <coughs> But we got there, and it was because of all of that. Now, when you get back to the 
preservative. And I told Jerry this morning, I do not like to lay down a bunch of acres of alfalfa at one time. You know, I like them five acre spots. I will do 10. But then when I get out there that day bailing, the first third of whatever I'm bailing, I'm on pins and needles thinking, am I here too quick? It's just a tad on the sticky side. The middle third of that field, man, I'm smiling. This is perfect. The last third, I'm sitting here scratching my head. I should have done had this bale that's getting a little dry on me. So I do not use a preservative, but I try to do small plots at a time to where I can bale it at that optimum moisture, not to lose them valuable leaves. Okay. So we got another, uh, thank you, thank you, Wade. So we got another question. Uh, Jay is asking, uh, almost everything I've seen with um, mixture, uh, mixture stands is with Bermuda grass. We have a few pastures of mostly fescue. Are there any grasses you would not recommend interceding with uh, alfalfa? From, from, I don't know, like from what I've seen, uh, usually it's mostly about the space between rows that we are generally concerned. But uh, I don't know if either of you have um, any, any grasses in mind that would not go well with alfalfa. Liliani, I think there, that's a good point about the row spacing and, and I saw Kim just unmute herself, so I'll let her talk a little bit more about the row spacing. Mm -hmm. uh, but specifically, I mean, you see a lot, and I think Wade kind of alluded to this earlier, about orchard grass mixtures. As you go through and, you know, you get towards the end of the life of the alfalfa, you're going to have grasses come in. Um, I would say with fescue, to me, it's not worth it to do it with Kentucky 31. I, it's to me that's kind of counterproductive to put a Kentucky 31 toxic endophyte tall fescue with alfalfa. Um, with a novel endophyte, that would be an excellent choice, similar to orchard grass. But you're going to be a need to be a little bit more diligent about making sure the alfalfa doesn't out compete. So um, I think that there are options. The hay grass is another one of those. The quality to me just isn't high enough to really benefit the alfalfa, which is why we stick with Tifton 85 and other Bermuda grasses um, that are of higher quality and digestibility. Um, but there are mm -hmm. some challenges. So now I guess I'll turn it over to Kim to talk about some of the challenges of interseeding. Right, so kind of following along with what Leanne had said, I think that um, she's right that if we just kind of reframe that question and think about the success stories of these mixtures of grasses with alfalfa. There has been quite a bit of extensive research done on tall fescue and alfalfa mixtures, as well as orchard grass and alfalfa mixtures. So I think those are an option. Uh, the more recent work in the Southeast has been with the Bermuda grass and alfalfa. And that's where the kind of the row spacing that they were talking about comes in. So in that particular mixture, oftentimes we're looking at uh, 14 to 15 inch row spacing between the alfalfa rows is just dependent upon your particular equipment and kind of the the drill setting or the spacing that can be accommodated by that equipment. Also you can interseed alfalfa into bahia grass. Uh, Mississippi State has done some work with that. It does appear that it's less persistent in the bahia grass systems compared with if you were looking at a Bermuda grass alfalfa mixture. Okay, thank you. So I think we have one question. Uh, Jeff Basinger, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name uh, wrong, but I'm going to unmute you. Yes, I was wondering, Wade had talked about the moisture content. What, if, if you could pick the perfect moisture content to bale, where is that? Where do you feel is too high and too low? <laughs> uh, million dollar question. Um, and I do I not. Did, I didn't want to ask. I didn't want to ask a, a easy question now. <laughs> well, see, I do not use a moisture meter. I have in the past. I use my hands, and I feel the hay. And and I, it's just experience is the way we run. You know, I can go out there and check several spots in that windrow 
and just by the feel of it, I can say, yes, I can get by, or no, I can't. Um, 99% of the time, I can do it with my hands. So to put a number on that, I actually can't do that. And I know that didn't help you out at all. So, so Jeffy, that, I don't have Wade's experience with it, but in reading about it, it's it's about the same moisture content as, as putting up good quality grass hay. Uh, you know, you, you can put it up a little higher moisture in square bales than you can in, in round rolls or, or the big square bales. Um, so, but it, it's not it's not significantly different than your experience with grass hay on the moisture content. Okay. Yeah, and we kind of have uh, uh, another question on the same uh, line, asking if uh, you have to do baleage with the first cutting due to weather issues. So I don't know if she had uh, issues uh, as much as on the north region of Alabama uh, regarding um, rain. So, well, uh, last year, our first cutting we did put up in Baylage, but uh, as far as this year, I don't know if y'all remember, but we had some almost 90 degree days in March. And uh, the, the week that I cut it on April the 1st, um, I had excellent weather and I was able to get it down to a uh, dry enough to where I could actually around build it, but uh, I had that moisture down to around the 20% mark. So I built it, used it as dry hay. Okay. Uh, Wade, do, would this you like to? Unusual. This was an unusual year as far as warm weather in uh, March and April. So um, I would say mm -hmm. typically you would probably need to put that first cutting up uh, as hay that's because uh, and wrap it high moisture. Sure. I never have put any alfalfa up as haylage. You know, we have other. Uh, species but not alfalfa now i will say that my first cutting you know i'm a little further north than steve so i have to wait later to cut and it does get a little rain um that's usually what i feed my horses they get the the worst end of this or ordeal and i sell the better hay to the customers uh, but we usually put that first cutting up in our barn dry because it is a little ranker a little stemmier but cause of them, but I never have had to do it in Baileys. Okay, thank you. So we just passed 2 p.m. here. So um, just as a brief uh, brief summary, what we uh, we kind of discussed here, uh, we mentioned a lot about the importance of soil uh, fertility and pH uh, to be correct for uh, alfalfa uh, establishment. Uh, we um, we also uh, talked about the importance of uh, having the harvest happening on the proper timing, especially on the first year, just to make sure that you, your, stand, your stand was going to, uh, to be uh, well established. This is going to help a lot, especially with the uh, root system and the storage uh, for that, that stand. And, uh, it's an option to use alfalfa as mixture with other grasses as we were just talking about. But I think the main uh, take home message here would be that the management uh, is key. And uh, it's important that it's very well defined and planned ahead and uh, for, for you to be able to su succeed on the alfalfa business.